with everybody. My name is Kat Bowser. I'm your resident fantasy therapist and welcome back to my channel. Those of you here for the first time, welcome. My name is Kat Bowser. I'm a licensed therapist. I'm also a writer working on my first two novels, one a standalone, one the start of a series. And on my channel I like to talk about what I consider to be the heart of all writing and that's the characters. And the heart of the characters is their psychology. So that's the angle I like to take pretty much with how I write, how I talk about writing topics, that kind of thing. So today I am doing actually a top 10 list, um, which I've done, I've done lists of like scariest places in fantasy, scariest creatures in fantasy, which I did for Halloween. This one, I actually got the idea um, from a mix of places. Um, first and foremost, uh, Daniel Green did a similar list about a year ago, so I will give credit where credit is due on that. Um, but I've also seen a lot of other people just, you know, just for fun, they like to list their favorite fantasy creatures. Um, and so when I saw Daniel Green's video, I thought, now this is a topic I wanted, to, I would like to talk about. So I'm giving full credit to him for this idea, but it sounded like something fun, and I think every fantasy fan has a different take on it, so I wanted to do my own. And that is your top 10 favorite fantasy races. So anyone who has been on my channel for a while knows that I am actually not a huge fan of humans in fantasy. And I have nothing against them, but they just usually don't hold my interest as much as the other races do. And so that's one reason I wanted to talk about fantasy races. So what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to list for you guys my top 10 favorite fantasy races, but also what you can kind of expect to see from them in my work. Not necessarily which work or where, but just kind of my favorite take on them. So with that being said, let's just jump into it. So number 10 on this list is going to be... Three were given to the elves, immortal, wisest, and fairest of all beings. So, as much of a Tolkien fan as I am, I'm actually not a huge fan of elves. Um, mainly because I think everybody takes Tolkien's stance now, which is fine. I mean, he had a very interesting idea in making them these um, almost otherworldly beings, very wise, immortal, all those kind of things. And I give full props for that because it was extremely well done. I mean, you can literally learn the languages that he came up with, and that's amazing. But <laughs> I think that because people have grown so accustomed to that type of elf, we almost forget that there are other types in mythology. And my favorite type is actually the trickster elf. I like the elves that kind of cause problems for people. But I also like the idea that maybe they do kind of resemble Tolkien's elves in that they're not necessarily small, ugly, evil looking kind of creatures, which seems to be kind of the thing in a lot of mythologies. I like the idea that they would take on a form that is very appealing to whomever they're going to trick. I really like that idea. So that's kind of the angle I like to take with elves. Now you will see them in my work. They're not usually going to be major characters though, because like I said, as much as I like Tolkien, I wasn't a huge fan of the elves. And I think elves, because of Tolkien, get a lot of attention. <laughs> so I mean, Tolkien himself obviously preferred the elves. I mean, you can tell by how much thought him and um, attention he put into their genealogy, their history, all that stuff. And incidentally, my favorite types of elves in Tolkien's work are the ones that break the mold. I love reading about Fëanor because he was an asshole. <laughs> um, and seeing him interact or try to interact with these other people that are trying to be genuinely nice people is what I like to read. That's why I like the Silmarillion so much. Um, but I also like characters like Luthien, who is a nice, she's a nice character. She's, um, she's uh, considered to be very beautiful, um, sweet, loves who she loves, but she also doesn't take any crap, and I like that. So overall, in my work, you're going to see more of the trickster kind of variety of elf, but maybe with a little dash of tokenism mixed in, because that's fun. <laughs> Uh, 
right, number nine. Do not take me for some conjurer of cheap tricks. I am not trying to rob you. Wizard slash sorceresses. Sorcerers. I like magic. <laughs> um, when I was a kid, it was one thing that drew me to fantasy was this idea of magic. Um, I am a bit different in that I am not a huge fan of wizards or sorcerers as a race per se. Like I'm not a I'm not a huge fan of the um, the Harry Potter idea of there's Muggles and then there's Magic born. Um, it's unique. I'll, I'll give you I'll give you that. It's well done, but it's just not my thing because I like the idea that anybody can learn magic and that there isn't this race barrier that keeps you from doing it. That being said though, wizards and sorcerers and sorceresses and stuff and witches and stuff, they're fun in fantasy because you can do a ton of stuff with them. <laughs> um, most of the time the you have the wise wizard, the mentor type character, which isn't a bad trope. I actually, I don't mind that trope honestly. Um, but it does start to get stale after a while. So one thing I like to do, I love to do sorcerers or magic users who are very naive in their art. They haven't quite learned what they're doing yet. <laughs> so they're making mistakes and they're not interpreting things correctly. I like to see people actually learning magic. Like it's, it's not something inherent to them, but it's something they're capable of doing. But they have to figure out how to do it. <laughs> um, I've always liked that. All right, number eight. Gods and goddesses. One of the fun things about fantasy is you can have so many different religions and you can make up any religion you want. <laughs> um, I like that. I like the idea of not necessarily gods and goddesses necessarily even intervening, but just the stories that people have about them. So, you know, in like Greek and Roman mythology, the gods came down and messed with mortals all the freaking time. Um, and that's fun. But I think it also introduces the, almost the problem of, well, if the gods are this powerful, couldn't they intervene and save their own world when they want to? And so I acknowledge that flaw. So I tend to like to keep my gods and goddesses more or less withdrawn but people still have stories about these times they did intervene and they don't necessarily know if they're true or not they don't necessarily know if they're ever going to do it again what prompted them to do it in the first place but the stories are still there and i think that's a really good way to kind of make your world feel more real too is to just sprinkle in these little stories and myths and things that people have that can give your story and your world a lot more weight and it makes it feel more real um, one of my favorite gods and goddesses to use is Natur because she's the goddess of life and of spring and she's primarily worshipped by the Natupa but she does, people, other races and other, um, other clans have heard of her and in some cases they actually have a version of her but she goes by a different name. So I like her because she is my master of loopholes in that she is one of the few gods and goddesses that has empathy and sympathy for people. And so she will try to find any way she can to intervene, but even she has rules that she has to abide by. So her one of her key personality traits is figuring out ways around rules. So especially among the Natuba, if you um if you are smart enough to figure out loopholes around certain rules or certain expectations, you're actually praised for it because you're said to be um, mimicking their goddess. So that's always fun. <laughs> All right, number seven. Can you really see her? Do you really know what she is? If you had been waiting to see a unicorn as long as I have. Unicorns. So this one, I have a long history of unicorns. When I was a little girl, I was obsessed with unicorns. I, I loved them. I used to collect them. I used to have a whole big collection of like statues and snow globes and all that stuff. Um, I think my first introduction to them was probably My Little Pony. And I do like some of the ideas in there. I like the idea that they can disappear and reappear. I like the idea that different ones have different skills, that kind of thing. Then I went on and I watched, um, 
I watched, started to watch and read other other things that had unicorns in them. Last Unicorn is still a favorite of mine, and I like that that one takes more of the traditional image of a unicorn with like the lion's tail and like the giraffe type neck and that kind of thing. That's fun. Um, I also like that there's other versions of the unicorn that you'll find in different mythologies. Like um, the Chinese unicorn is really unique looking, and I really like that. Um, so one thing I do in my world that I don't see a lot of writers do, my unicorns are not nice people. <laughs> um, they are immortal. I think that's kind of a standard of the mythos. Um, but because of that, they're very vain and they kind of see themselves as better than everybody else and don't really see themselves as needing to intervene with everybody else. Now, naturally, this is a broad spectrum. You're going to have some creatures of this race that are quite pleasant to be around. But as a general rule, they kind of have this superiority complex. <laughs> um, and I like to have the idea that unicorns can take on different forms. And by that, I mean, in my world, you have the unicorn that looks like the traditional unicorn. You have the unicorn that looks like the Chinese unicorn. You have the unicorn that looks like a horse with a horn on its head. And they all come from the same source, but they they take on these different characteristics just by luck of the draw, kind of like how we can be born with brown hair, red hair, blue eyes, green eyes, same kind of thing. So you can have a male and a female unicorn, that one that looks like, um, say, the Chinese unicorn and one that looks like the traditional unicorn. They can give birth to a, a unicorn that looks just like a pony with a horn on its head. And that's totally normal. <laughs> I like that. I like the creativity that you have in that. So again, they're not huge players in my world, but you will see them. And um, those scenes I hope will be fun for you guys. Number six. Monsters. I love these things. Um, and this is, I think, a very, very broad category because there's lots of mythological monsters and beasts and creatures, and I really love all of them because they're so unique. Um, like, actually, last night, my husband was telling me, um, in Arizona, if you go up north, um, there is a legend among the native people that now rangers and scouts and stuff talk about, and that is uh, um, the Mogollon Monster which is like a Bigfoot Sasquatch like looking creature. Um, and then there's theories that it's a skinwalker, which is from another Native American myth. Um, there's theories, you know, that it's nothing at all. There's theories that it's, it's a giant wolf. Lots of different ideas. And that's what I like about beasts and monsters is you can have the same creature that takes on completely different forms depending on who you're talking to. So you could have two races talking about the same creature, but they're all going to have different interpretations of what it is, where it came from, what it looks like. And those are always fun to deal with. So that is one thing I like. Um, I think almost with any kind of epic fantasy story, you're going to run into stories of monsters and beasts. And I like to throw in that sometimes you have helpful ones and sometimes you have non-helpful ones. Um, because I think that evens it out because Especially if you look at um, Native American legend, most of the time, while there's tricksters and things like that, if you usually if you leave them alone, they're not going to bother you unless you invade their territory or you damage something sacred to them. And I like that kind of angle. So that that's kind of the angle I take is that there's there's some monsters that yes they can. They can mess you up, they can kill you, but if you don't approach them, they're probably going to leave you alone. But then you have ones that are on the other side of the spectrum that just like to mess with people because they can. <laughs> um, it's, a, it's a nice way to throw a little tension into your quest. All right, number five. Scotsmen call them the fair folk. The Vikings call them dark elves. They are changelings, shapeshifters. Creatures of pure magic, and their possessions, like the mirror, are vessels of great power. Fae. Ooh, fae are fun. 
Uh, I was actually first introduced to Faye through Gargoyles, the old TV show, um, because they used them as both protagonists and antagonists, and that was fun. I like Faye because there is so much variety with them. I mean, they're generally seen as trickster types, um, but they also kind of like everything. They can be helpful, but you kind of have to watch yourself with them because they're kind of conniving little things. And that's the that's what I like about them. And in my world, elves and fae, they're not the same race, but they are related in some sense. So that's why my elves have kind of that trickster quality to them. But the thing that I like to do with my fae is, in my world, elves are more the trickster kind of um, try to cheat you kind of creatures. They generally in my world have a little more honor to them. If you strike a deal with them, they're probably going to keep it. Um, the problem is, the rules say I can't take it from you. I needed you to fork it over. Um, and I just like to, I like to show their interactions with mortals because I think that's fun. Um, when you have a creature that if they're not immortal, they're very long-lived, and just the way that they would interpret some of the things that mortals do, I think that's fun. Um, one little trait my fae have is that one of their weaknesses is human food, in that if you present them with human food, they're probably going to help you. <laughs> um, because in their own wor words, of all the things we have learned to master, the art of mortal cooking has never been one of them. So that is an advantage that my characters can have over them if presented with them. Um, I do keep the fey weakness of iron because I think like, kind of like with the unicorns and immortality, I think that's kind of a key part of the mythos. Um, but I don't know, I think it's, it's kind of fun to just have fey not necessarily there as an antagonist, but kind of just as a as a co-character that just kind of does their own thing. <laughs> um, I don't have them as major players, but they are there. Um, and I probably will have one or two secondary characters that do end up being Faye at some point. I don't think it's going to probably be in the first story, maybe in the second or third though. Um, just because like I said, they're just fun to play with. <laughs> Number four. So <laughs> So I grew up with the idea of the mermaid from The Little Mermaid, Disney's Little Mermaid. I think a lot of people did. You know, I used to draw them, I used to make them different colors, all this stuff. Um, but then as I got older and I started exploring different mythos, I realized, you know, a lot of myths have mermaids as these really cruel, mean creatures, and I don't usually see that done. <laughs> and I don't know why, because it's interesting. Um, in my world, mermaids are called sirens, um, and incidentally, um, while those are from Greek mythology, we're actually starting to think that they actually might have been like these flying creatures, not necessarily water creatures, but I digress. Um, I like the word sirens. <laughs> but my sirens are a race that lives in the ocean, particularly the oceans up north, and they have very fish-like faces, webbed hands, claws, um, and they eat organs. Like when they kill fish and whales and things like that, it's not the meat they're after. They're after the organs in inside them, particularly the liver and the kidneys. And so that is what they go after with my main characters, in that these are very dangerous creatures. They're intelligent. Um, they tend to be solitary, but they can work together if need be. So they're... They're a genuine threat when my characters try to travel, especially up north, because up north, about the only way you can get around if the if there isn't a frozen path is through the water. And anytime you go out, especially on dark water, these things are a threat. And because they're at home in the water, you're really not going to have a chance to beat these things in the water. I mean, that is their territory. But 
they do have weaknesses to them. I mean, every creature does. Um, one of the main ones is, is they're particularly deep sea creatures, so um, bright lights don't usually do well with them. Um, and they're, they tend to be one-track minded when they get their mind on a kill, so if you actually come with some kind of organ meat with you and toss it in the water, that will probably distract them long enough for you to get where you're going. But again, depends on how many are around. <laughs> Uh, I think one of the best ones I've seen done with mermaids is probably um, Romika Takahashi's uh, manga Mermaid Forest. Very, very well done. Um, mermaids in that one, the, the myth is that if you eat mermaid flesh, you live forever. But only certain people do. Some people get very violently ill and they die. In fact, most people die. Um, some will turn into this monstrous creature called a lost soul. Um, so you're really taking a risk. And whatever age you're at when you eat the flesh is the age you're stuck at. Um, I thought that was a very interesting take on them. Um, and she also did, especially near the beginning, they could go on land and they could take on the appearance of like older women. And they would go after young women because when mermaids eat human flesh, they gain youth. And I think, I thought that was very interesting, so. Mermaids, they can be a lot more fun than what we've shoe-holded them into. All right, number three. Tr dragons. I love me some dragons. Um... There's a lot of different types of dragons. Um, I think when people think of dragons, they usually think of like the fire breathing type beasts from like mythology or like from Game of Thrones. And those are fun. I do like those kind. Um, but I wouldn't mind seeing more of the type that like can't fly or don't breathe fire, but are still these big lumbering beasts and are still very dangerous. Um, my favorite type are the type of dragons that Tolkien created in that they're very intelligent. They can communicate, they're conniving. I love that kind of dragon because you have a beast that in some cases can still be flat fire, can fly, but is also intelligent, ancient, old, in some cases has manipulation abilities. And I think that just makes for a much more frightening creature. <laughs> um, I have nothing against like the animal type kind of dragons, like the ones that are just beasts and not necessarily sentient. I think those can be fun, but I much prefer the idea of one that was intelligent and probably had its own culture and its own race kind of thing. I like that. I think that is a much more fun idea to explore. So. You'll probably see more intelligent dragons in my work, although I won't discount that there probably can be some of the animal-like types, because I think there's lots of different types. Um, for instance, I'll just give you guys an example. Um, up in the north, among the Natula, they have a legend of essentially what is an ice serpent, which is very much like the beast-like dragons from a lot of our myths. but instead of being able to fly, they swim. And instead of breathing fire, they breathe what they call liquid ice, which is essentially um, kind of like liquid nitrogen, and it will freeze and shatter you on contact. So those are some legends that they have. Whether or not we'll ever actually meet one, I haven't quite decided yet. I'll have to see where I go with that. All right, number two. It's inconceivable for a demon. Natural. I'm a half demon. I have what it takes to destroy you. All thanks to my human mother. Hybrids. I love the idea of a creature created from two different races, especially since this is fantasy. I think the idea that they can combine together and create a child. I think that's totally plausible. This is fantasy. <laughs> um... I, like, I love the idea of making a character that has the benefits or the weaknesses of both races. Um, I mean, Tolkien had his half-elven, but um, we've also had stories that have half-orc. 
Um, we've had some stories that have, you know, blends of human, alien, you know, all kinds of things, uh, wolf creatures. And I just think it's cool. I think, I think it can make for an interesting character and a character that has their own flaws and their own personal struggles because of where they come from, because they're not either one or the other. They're this odd mix. And I like that. I, I just think that that is a neat way to, one, talk about some connection between the races, and that's always fun. I love it when we can do that. Um, but also, I don't know, I, I think every hybrid character that I've read in stories I've usually liked because of the unique struggle and characteristics they have. But like I said in my uh, video a while back I did on this trope of half human, um, half human, half non-human, I don't like it when they have to choose a side. Um, when they have to decide, okay, I'm going to be more vampire, I'm going to be more human, I'm going to be more mermaid or whatever. I don't like that because what makes them unique is the fact that they are a blend. And I think that creates, the idea to me is that that would almost create a new race of types of people. And I think that's fun, especially, like I said, in fantasy, where you don't have this limitation of, well, they can't genetically reproduce because it's fantasy. Um, you know, you could say that the magic genes allow them to reproduce. I don't know, you know, pick, pick a reason. But I think there's a lot more intriguing possibilities when they admit to just being half and half and that kind of makes them their own special person. All right, number one, my all-time favorite fantasy race. Welcome, my sister's sons. To the kingdom of Erebor. I love me some dwarves. <laughs> I do. I love dwarves. Um, and I think the reason I do is because they usually get shafted <laughs> in fantasy. They, they really do. I think World of Warcraft is really the only one where they really get um, any, any real focus. Um, most of the time the focus is on elves or men or, you know, other races. But I've always loved the dwarves. I, I don't know. I think it's because I have... I really love craftsmen, like people that can make things with their hands, and the idea of creating homes within a mountain, because I've been in caves and they're beautiful. I've, I've been to mountains and they're beautiful, and I can just imagine a kingdom or a homestead made with these elements, and I love it. Um, the dwarves in my world are called stonemen, um, because they're actually not short. <laughs> um, uh, they would be considered short to some races, but for the most part, they're not short. Um, they still have the long hair that most dwarves come with and the beards, but they serve a more practical purpose. Um, they almost act like antenna when they are down in the mines and deep in the mountain because their hair has nerves in it. And that's another reason why they usually don't cut it and they keep it usually bound in braids so that it doesn't get snagged on stuff because that would not be pleasant. Um, I try to take some inspiration from a variety of things. Like my dwarfs are this weirdo mix of like some Norse inspiration, but also some Polynesian inspiration. Um, I originally had them in like a mountain range, but then I realized I needed to spread out my world a little bit. So now they're actually on an island and it's it's actually turned out to be a lot of fun because I can blend all these interesting ideas together. And I just, most of the time when I read dwarves, there, there is this very strong devotion to family. And I really like that. Everything I did, I did for them. Because um, like I said, I am a big fan of platonic relationships. So any race that is going to put emphasis on that, I'm going to love. And that's the case with dwarves. I just... I don't know, they're, they're just my jam. So um, one of my main characters, Nali, is a stoneman. So you're gonna see a lot of him. Um, you'll see a lot of his culture. And I really hope you guys will love it as much as I do. 
So those were my top 10 favorite fantasy races. I hope you guys found it interesting. Um, I actually would love to hear what you guys like in fantasy because let's face it, there's a ton that I didn't even touch on because there's so many. Um, so feel free to leave your idea of your top 10 below or maybe even just a handful of and why you like them. I'd love to read them. As always, um, if you have comments or questions or suggestions, make sure to leave them below or contact me on social media. I will get back to you as soon as I can. If you like this kind of content, make sure you subscribe and ring the bell so you don't miss when I upload. And until next time, I hope you guys have a great one.